Hey, welcome back. Thanks for joining. Now today I'm going to cover what's new in Virilize Automation 8.4. Now it's a bit late, it's been out for a bit, uh, but one, I've been really busy. Unfortunately, I'm going to start bringing out a ton more videos, uh, especially when I have a salt stack series as well, uh, since I'm starting to do and see some pretty cool stuff uh, in integrations there. But uh, let's, let's get into this and obviously, as always with my uh, what's new, I'm only going to really cover what I think is important based on what I see the customers that I deal with want uh, or, have net or, or need, but there's always a ton more stuff that's in there, right? Lots of bug fixes, performance improvements. Now, in this release, if you don't really use Azure or multi-disk uh, deployments or Ansible, you're probably gonna, not going to notice too much different, right? Um, so the, the biggest one here is, is especially around Azure, there was a lot of, lots of good wins for Azure. Now, from what I think, I actually think the multi, the actual disk support is being the biggest one uh, within this. Uh, so what I mean by disk, disk support is we can now have clusters of disks, but we can also specify the SCSI ID that they're connected to. Now you couldn't do this before, uh, and I've been in in some where we've been trying to deploy, you know, big SQL clusters and other things, trying to attach disks, and then trying to do things. You know, there, there wasn't a clear rhyme or reason about which ID these disks were placed, and it made it very hard on the automation. Now we can actually specify, which is really really cool. Um, so if you have a look, at, I've got a I've got a couple of designs here. So let's have a look at some of the disk support stuff uh, that's that's now available. So let's have a look at multi-disk first. Uh, so this is an example of a cluster uh, with a cluster of disks. So you can see here I've got my, my cluster of machines with a cluster of disks. Now you could technically do this in the earlier versions, uh, but it, was, it wasn't very nice. Like once it had been deployed, uh, if you were to delete a disk, you'd delete all of them. Like it just, it shouldn't have worked, it did work, but you had consequences, right? Now it's actually fully fledged supported. Uh, and if we go, if we go into here, uh, let's, uh, let's make this a bit wider here. Uh, we can see now uh, I've got some allocate per instance is a new property. Uh, so this allows us to basically say that on, I've got a cluster of two disks here. That means I want two disks allocated uh, to that machine. Uh, type thing, so they're not a shared disk, so which is good. Uh, and then we've got you know the attached disks here. So uh, what what we're doing, what we're doing here, uh, is I'm just basically saying if I have an input of two machines, I'm going to have four disks. Uh, and this particular this this attached disks here is basically just saying you know attach the disks just by adding one to it essentially it's not um uh, it's not too complex there uh, but yeah so that's all that's happening there so um, I could have hard coded these two so I could have had four up here and then I put two down here but if you wanted two disks per host or per machine then I've obviously got to times this by two right um, uh, for every count of machines so then we've got enough and this will make sure that the right disks are attached to the right machines uh, that are on there. So after we actually deploy this, um, I've actually uh, got a new. Uh, I've already deployed this. So here, what we, here's what we um, provisioned earlier. Uh, so I have a look at this one, and we can see here this is very different already. So you can see how it's attached. I can actually see the attached volumes here of the different disks. Uh, that are available here and I can do my individual actions to each one of the disks now This is something that you couldn't do before right? So it's it's you know from a storage point of view It's very very rich uh, and obviously if you if you go to your machines, you've, you've got the standard uh, output there, right? Um, but yeah having this each one of these so we can see I've provisioned uh, Three machines here each one of them have got two disks uh, obviously they're disk 0 1 two, three, four, five uh, within there, but they're all attached, they're all available, um, and you can do individual actions to each single one. So before you could do an action, but it was on the group, you couldn't do it at each individual disk. So now you can resize them individually. The day two ops around this is amazing, right? So this is something that was called for very, very heavily uh, to be able to use. Uh, but also on this, let's have a, let's go back and have a look at another design. Uh, and we'll have a look at multi-disc multi-size. 
So all these blueprints I'm doing, they're available on the GitHub. I'll put the links in the video below. Uh, so you'll be able to go to them, copy and paste them and whatnot. It's same with uh, uh, a lot of it. It's something I've started doing uh, some time ago, but when I'm showing the code and other things, I'll actually supply all that. You can just go there and grab it. And this one here is our multi, um, multi-disc multi-disc array so this is this allows us and this is something you couldn't do before is be able to put in the um, different sizes for your discs so instead of having different disc objects like volume objects like pulling over here and making different sizes and attaching them now you don't need to you can have just that one single volume there but then you can specify the size of the disc for each single one of them so we'll see here uh, that I'm gonna have a, an array uh, of objects basically, essentially, that's going to map, you know, how many disks that I've got. So in this particular instance, it's going to be two disks. Uh, and then you can see here, I'm going to attach them to all the disks, which is fine. Uh, and then on here, the capacity here is your input disk size count.index.size. So we'll go into here. So you've got the, essentially, you know, you would have your index of your item in there, then you would have your size, which is integer. So we'll be able to get that. So if we go and actually deploy this, and I'll just, just show you. Um, yep, yeah, uh, let's go next. So we've got here, so we've got disk size, uh, and I can put it in different sizes here. So I might go five gig for the first one, uh, and then I might do two gig for the second one, right? Cool, that's all I can do. I'll deploy that and off that will go. Um, so if we go to this one, we'll see this slowly start coming together. All right, so it hasn't quite finished here uh, attaching these yet, but we can already see. We've got disk one of five gig of capacity and we've got six, uh, disk two of two giga capacity. So when that's fully finished deploying, uh, it will be attached. And again, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, if we have a look at the multi-disk size here, we can see that's all good. Um, we can see the disk sizes there, three and five. I use a different one for that original one. And again, you've got your individual uh, individual actions there uh, for your for your machines. All right, for your disk, sorry. Awesome. All right, and the other thing we can do is obviously SCSI placement. Now this, I believe, I don't know, I guess we could make it work in a clustered uh, arrangement. I haven't actually looked at that yet, um, but essentially, maybe you could do it actually with, with some, um, some functions there to be able to do it. But essentially what you do is you put in uh, these, uh, you put in the these two, um, properties, which is SCSI controller. So which SCSI controller are you going to? One, two, three, whatever, and then the unit number. So essentially that's going to, you know, one through to 15 or whatever, whatever it might be. Uh, but this actually allows you to place that particular volume on that particular SCSI ID. Uh, and that way it makes automation and being able to do things within the operating system uh, a lot easier because you know which disk is which, etc. right? So, you know, very, very simple. That's, that's how you use it. Uh, so I'll actually pull that one out because uh, I don't want to wreck this one. Awesome. All right, so that's on the disk side of the fence. Um, next would be the Azure. So this is something that I've been pushing for, same as in 8.3 with the resource groups, but this is specifically for availability sets. So again, availability sets have a very finite number that they can have within a subscription in Azure. Uh, and by default, every time you did a deployment, uh, it would create a, a availability set underneath. Now, availability sets are used for, you know, if you want to do the maintenance, uh, if you're, for, sorry, if you've got an application, you want to be part of an availability set to make sure that it's not on the host that need to have maintenance at the same time. So there's always something that's available, right? It just gives you a bit of high availability, uh, even though you can't see in the physical infrastructure of uh, Azure, uh, at least it gives you the, the comfort that, you know, if something was to go down and your half is gonna go down, right, for instance. So uh, within this, with the, with the uh, Azure, um, it's very, very simple. Uh, to be able to use. So there's a number of, actually there's quite a lot of Azure improvements, uh, but I'm just gonna cover 
uh, the, the the basic ones. So essentially here we've got the uh, Zoom machine and you can see here I've actually specified availability set uh, which is temp uh, and resource group which is uh, VRA7, right? So you couldn't do this before. Now I'm just going to deploy this one uh, to Azure. So we go uh, so a demo, deploy that. All right. So that will go off and deploy. Now when that actually starts uh, creating, what we'll do is I'll show you on the Azure side of the fence uh, what that looks like. Allocate. Approval. Yeah, cool. Creating the disk. So if I go over to Azure, we'll be able to see I've got my availability sets here. Now this is typically what you would see, this availability set. If you didn't specify the availability set, it would actually create one for that deployment and it will put every machine that's deployed or part of that deployment into that availability set. Now this can, you know, that's fine, it works. You know, if you don't really care, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but the problem with that is, is obviously I think there's, again, it's like a 2000 limit of availability sets uh, per per um, uh, subscription or region or whatever I've forgotten exactly what it is, and that then is artificial limiting the scale that you can use. Like you can obviously put in a lot more VMs than two thousand uh, within there, but if you only had one VM per deployment, then that's what's going to happen, right? So this way you can actually specify or existing ones, and we can see there that one's creating within there. Uh, if we go back to our cloud assembly. If I go to topology, we should be able to see that that's uh, 3911 and that's the one that's building right there. So that's building within that new availability set. Awesome, that's working. So a lot of organizations will have predefined availability sets uh, that they would want to be able to place machines into to make sure they're highly available. Right? So that works like a treat. Um, now one of the other awesome things uh, with Azure, so if we go out of this one and again here's one I prepared earlier have a look at this so within here we've actually we can actually snapshot now so out of the day two we can create disk snapshots uh, on on your um, your volumes as well as uh, actually on your your main VM uh, which is awesome uh, as day two actions now there's also other things that supports uh, the image gallery in VRA now it also supports uh, the encryption um, what is it? Uh, uh, disk encryption sets um, as well, and yeah, so all around really good improvements on Azure. Now, something I'm not won't be able to show you this, but I haven't, uh, I haven't actually. I need to fire up my Ansible servers again. Uh, one of the next one would have been the Ansible integration. So before, if anyone had used it, it only placed the IPs in the uh, hosts. Uh, uh, the, the host file uh, for Ansible and now places the machine name DNS right uh, so that was that was obviously a really really big ask there um, and it, it's got a few different things it's got better execution but just just all around better integration really uh, which is which is a pretty good thing uh, there was some small puppet you know, puppet um, uh, improvements made no, nothing really to mention on that front right now, the other big thing that came with it, uh, then now I've got the SaltStack um, SecOps compliance. So when you upgrade here, you've got your vulnerability in SecOps. Uh, awesome, I can't wait to use this a bit more. I've been playing with it, uh, just in general, uh, putting against some compliance. Uh, it is really cool. Uh, I'm glad this, this integration is getting higher and higher, uh, which is awesome. And yeah, we um, I haven't got any vulnerability scanning yet. I've got to create some policies, uh, but having that capability within the platform now, uh, as well as the automation, the config management that SaltStack brings, whew, you know, it's it's really a killer uh, combination.
Right. Now, another cool thing. Now, this is pretty close to my heart because I love VRO. I always have. I've got a soft spot for it. Unfortunately, I found myself moving more and more away from it. I still always recommend it for really complex automation tasks or orchestration tasks that, you know, that's what you use rather than run your own. But what they've now brought in is the plugin for VRA 8 and um, Cloud. So now you don't have to write your own. Now it's only the first part. So this is only the, the initial release. Uh, it is extremely light on. It literally is adding a host and uh, some rest requests, right? Uh, at the end of the day. So if we go down here, we can see we've got, we've got a new folder here, Virilize Automation 8 uh, and Cloud Services meaning that we can add either VRA 8 or our VRA cloud hosts into here. Uh, we can then do some basic operations, delete, get, patch, those sort of things, right? So I think once this become, once it becomes more objects uh, available in here, and if we actually go and have a look at uh, the inventory here, we can see, uh, there it is there. So there's the new plugin. Uh, it's automatically set up there for, for this particular one, but it's going to you know, just be anyone who's familiar with the the previous, uh, the VRA 7 and before that 6 uh, uh, VRO plugins, essentially. Uh, you know, I hope it gets that sort of level where you've got a lot of objects, you can do a lot of really fancy stuff without having to write much of your own code. Uh, but anyway, that's the first step of that that's gone into there, which is really, really good. Um, and outside that, I think that's really it. Like there's been some ABX and Kubernetes scale things increased. Terraform can now use um, OpenShift uh, uh, endpoint. And yeah, you know, I think that is really it. Um, as I said, it's, it's it, you know, it's been pretty solid uh, as it was. I think there's also, there's also a couple of new, oh, sorry, that's not it. Uh, I just remembered and that's service broker. How can I forget service broker? So again, more improvements this time on the policies, uh, to be able to be able to create them now. So there's actually some really, really cool, um, additions into that. So in the approval policies, uh, so now we can, we can have a lot more granular, uh, interact. So if I go, I can actually go into resources, has any, um, I can then go to tags so I can start grouping my grouping my approval criteria around tags and CPU count um, Yeah, so you know this uh, this just allows you to do more fine more fine granular Approval policies based on what you're looking for. I think the inclusion of tags. I think the inclusions of uh, CPU count and memory uh, there's new operators have been put in there as well uh, to be able to, you know, do, uh, you know, created by and owned by. They're, they're just adding different fields, uh, different operators in there as well, just so that you can you can start developing these these um, approval policies that can pretty much meet anything that you need, right? Uh, so big tick there. I hope they keep doing this. Um, I want to see. Uh, the event-based approvals so I can go off and do something externally bring back in whether it's approved or not That's still not there uh, But hopefully soon fingers crossed um, But other than that, I think that is it uh, there's, there's obviously it's not it. There's a lot more in there, right? Uh, but keeping this video short and sweet um, That is pretty much it uh, it was, I'm, I'm loving the rate at uh, the releases of the um, capabilities, and especially if you're on VRA Cloud, you're getting that every month, right? So this is more focused on, I guess, the drop at 8.4, where at that point in time, 8.4 and VRA Cloud would be identical. Um, obviously, once we move a month away from that, month or two months away, then Cloud gets additional features and stuff, right? So and it's updated more regularly. Um, but... Other than that, thank you for joining me. I'll try and get some more videos put out as soon as I can. Take care out there, and I'll see you next time. See you, bye.